seriously such an exciting time for tradespeople and for those who are pursuing their entrepreneurial journey. I'm here today to share with you uh, my story on why I chose to step outside the societal norms and what outside the box and pursue a career in trades and why I chose uh, to become an entrepreneur. So let's get started. Uh, and like Cecile said, if you have any questions along the way, drop them in the chat box and I would be happy to answer them here when I'm done. So my name is Jess. If you would have told me five years ago that I'd be living my best life as a tradesperson, uh, a first responder and the CEO of my own company, I honestly would have told you that you were nuts, like crazy. Um, I work, uh, I grew up in a small town in Northern Alberta, which was 100% dependent on the oil field industry. And I have worked in and out of the trades for the past 15 years. Uh, I currently live on in the outskirts of Edmonton and am pursuing my entrepreneurial journey uh, with my company, Just Black. And I'm a phone call firefighter uh, during the daytime. Uh, I've worked in the oil field, uh, pipeline construction, um, you know, road construction, you name it. Uh, I have a, a BA from Portage College and a degree from in management from the U of L. So shout out uh, to everybody from the U of L campus today. It's it's a privilege. Um, my trades journey started from at a very very young age. Um, my family were all tradespeople, so it's something that has honestly been embedded to me in me since you know I could walk, talk, you name it. Uh, my dad was a heavy equipment operator who love to bulldoze shit down. And I probably should not say that, but that's, you know, it's trades, right? So my mom was an RN who eventually sh uh, sh uh, made the shift to a uh, shift worker at our local pulp mill. And my, all my family around me were truck drivers, uh, you know, uh, plumbers, electricians, all very hands-on in within the trades industry. So trades has always, always, always been a lifestyle, uh, especially living in my small town and, and a choice for me. Okay. When I was young too, my mom and, or sorry, my dad and I always had a dream that we would become heavy equipment operators together and that we'd have our own business and like we'd go hand in hand uh, or sorry, work side by side together. Uh, so Picking this lifestyle as my first choice was really no question. So, so yeah, so as I said before, um, trade has always, always been, have has caught my interest. And I found that no matter what journey or what choice I made, I always seemed to end back up doing something in the trades. Now, I did mention that I've been in and out of the trades for the past 15 years. I started extremely, extremely young. Um, I, you know, I, my first job was a, a sprayer for my uncle's uh, constructor oil field company. And basically uh, what we did is we used to uh, be dropped off in remote locations, oil field locations, and uh, we dropped there for the day and we'd spray the lease and then be picked up at the end of the day. So that was really, really cool. Um, the, the things that I've saw, the people that I worked with and like the isolation of just being in the trees, like I knew that from that job that I was always like meant to be do this kind of stuff and not like meant for anything that was like nine to five right even though i work nine to five for myself now right but uh my career choice was then going to be like more hands-on and more physical and more male related because like i said it always gravitated towards me so from there on i had many
to try anything. Are we frozen? Okay. So anyway, at the age of, at the age of 25, I started to really take my trades journey, like my, sorry, my trades career more, more serious. So I'm going to share with you right here a PowerPoint which I forgot to do at the beginning. Let's see here, insert. Okay. So this was the first slide, but you know what? We're gonna go past it. So at 25, I started to take my trades journey much, much more seriously. Uh, 26, I decided that I was gonna go back to school, get my heavy equipment operating ticket. Uh, 20, still in that exact same year, I took my truck driving ticket. And at 28, I decided that I was going to fight fire. Uh, I never thought in a million years that I would be a certified provincial firefighter, but um, now I'm 30 and I really think that anything's possible. So, uh, and I did this because I knew that deep down that I was meant to be working in the trades. And I love the trades and for all those women who are trades people uh, in this room right now, I could like, I recommend them. Like I fully support any trades journey or trades story journey jump because it is actually one of the most rewarding professions that you can have. And honestly, like for the next 10, how many years I have left, I will continue to build my life in the trades because I just, I just love it so, so much. And I couldn't be happier uh, pursuing this career and, you know, doing what I do now, which is, you know, on the side operating, firefighting, and now my entrepreneurial journey. So that's kind of, oh, sorry. So let's see here, back up here. So however, let me be real with you. My life seems pretty freaking cool here. And I honestly, like I said, I do have a pretty cool life, but my life always what like wasn't always this way. We've all heard about rock bottom, and I guarantee a bunch of people or everybody in this room has hit their rock bottom. And it wasn't until I hit rock bottom like once, maybe twice, maybe three times that it I actually like felt it okay my rock bottom that really that i felt came to me at 25 and you're probably thinking oh, okay you have such a cool life and like you know you did all this cool stuff you did your education and you know uh you have a degree and you know i had a honestly a full-time job and everything and i'm still like honestly miserable I, okay, I can't emphasize how miserable I was, like, 25 and before, like, you know, we, like, we were just talking before everyone jumped up about how women, you know, we're so by the rules, we're so like, hey, let's just please people and make people happy. Uh, I was doing that until I, I hit 25, until I, all of a sudden, my world just came to a crashing stop. Um, the chaos in my life had like slowed down and I honestly like honestly had some time to reflect. So anyway, so I'm just going to backtrack here. So besides all these accomplishments is what people don't see is is the decade of struggle that I took to get here, right? Hitting this rock bottom, feeling this rock bottom and like just trying to own what I was feeling. So a little personal note about me, like my earlier ages, is that I had this great vision to be a heavy equipment operator with my dad. And like, you know, my mom was so hands on with her career. And, you know, I was surrounded by all these trades people, right? But unfortunately, by the time I was 18, I legit lost both my parents to addiction and mental illnesses, which completely, completely, like, uprooted my world right i 
didn't really take the time to process or understand because when you're 18, you're graduating high school or you're going to school. Like I, I went to Portage College and I was like, you know what? I'm going to pursue this. And I'm, I was just really unsure and just like in like survival mode. And so honestly, from 18 to for the next seven years, I can only describe my life as very turbulent and basically uh, I was in survival mode. I legit took every job that I could to pay rent, to keep my power on and to buy the bare necessities for groceries, even though it was pulling away, pulling myself away from the, the stuff that I truly love to do, which was like, like I said, more hands-on stuff, more trades, like, all these things like I was sort of deal. So I went to school. I didn't really have time to focus on it. Uh, be, like I said, because when I went to school, it was school, work, sleep, right? Uh, this phase was my life, or sorry, this phase of my life was very, very like such a blur for me, actually, that like I said, when I say turbulent, that's all I can describe it. And all I can remember was when I hit 25, I remember hitting this like, like lull in my life where I'm like, holy crap, I am so miserable. I am so disconnected. I'm actually, I think I'm depressed, right? And like, like I said, being on my own from such a young age, I didn't really understand what I was feeling. And I was like, you know what? Like when you're in survival mode, don't properly take care of like what you're feeling what you're processing or even understanding like what grief and loss and change and what moving even moving forward is so all i knew is that 25 nothing in my world felt right okay and then at this time in my life i you know i had such great things happening by the time I was 25, I had a degree, I had a house, I had a car, I had a full-time job uh, as a min support for a road construction company. And something that like, honestly, that I did not expect myself committing to for so long. Like I worked at that job for almost five years. And I'm like, and I woke up one day and I was like, um, what am I doing, right, with my life? And the only plus thing that I really enjoyed about that uh, construction company was the fact that even though I was a min support, I was surrounded by heavy equipment all day long, right? So I'd look out my front, my window, and all I would see is dozers and track hose and graders and people in coveralls, and I could smell dirt and oil. And I, and I thought to myself, I was like, you know what? why am I not doing this, right? Why am I sitting at this desk, punching in numbers? And why am I doing this? And why am I still doing this, right? So anyway, I fortunately had the best general manager ever who, who compromised with me, which is, I, I think the only reason I stayed as long as I did is that we compromised saying that, hey, if you could get your admin support done, super like in the mornings you're able like I will allow you to go and touch those equipment and help mechanics and wash them and you know order parts for them so I was like sweet uh so I learned to work fast um sorry I have notes uh learn to work fast so anyway however it doesn't matter like it didn't matter how much I was touching the equipment. The fact that in my admin role, I like it was still my full time position and I hated that, right? Like I, I just, I was grateful for the opportunity, but I was just still miserable, right? So I, I stayed at the job until I was like 25. And I like, like I said, I started to really just like seek help and like the processing of like, degree from my parents and like, you know, and just trying to like figure out a balance with life. And it wasn't, like I said, until I hit 25 that I decided to change. Okay. In that year, 
Um, unfortunately, uh, okay, so I am about to get super personal and this, uh, you know, and talk about my aunt Karen, who has, who has a, who has had a major, major influence on my trades journey and even impacts the decisions that I make now. So when I hit 25, I uh, got word. So I discovered that my aunt, uh, who was literally my trades, trades mentor, she was five foot three, spicy as, as every tradeswoman that I know out there. She was strong, she was bold, she was beautiful. Uh, she, I found out that she had gotten uh, a diagnosis with cancer and it really hit home for me because she was giving the lifespan of like, you know, one year to live. And I was like, holy crap. I was like, you know, as I, you know, was working at this construction company, me and her like over the last five years got really, really close because it's like, hey, you know, we would talk equipment and she used to operate them. And, you know, she used to be a laborer for the city of Edmonton and, she like and like she and her husband like even had opened up a landscaping company that did really really well so like i really relied on her and like looked up to her especially like you know uh it like especially because she was she was doing the life that i wanted and i remember like before my aunt's last christmas uh and it was you know it was just right after her diagnosis that I was sitting with her uh, complaining, and this this sounds super pathetic right now, like looking back, but I sat with her before, like like I said, before her last Christmas, and I was like, you know what? I was complaining how crappy my life was, right? And how miserable and how upset and how depressed I was. And she was like, honestly, like this is like a pivotal moment for me because she was literally just staring at me with this like dumb look on her face, right? Like, like girl, like get your crap together, right? And like I said, anyone who knew my Auntie Karen knew she was blunt and bold and, you know, but she was also, she also had your best interests at heart. Uh, so she looked at me and she literally told me, and I, I hate to say this, but she literally told me to get my head out of my, uh, but and to give my like head a shake because I have the choice to change, right? And and to have no excuses, right? And you know the crazy thing about it is I honestly like sitting across from her and like you know basically being called out on my own crap. I I was like kind of shocked, and she and she responded she responded to me and said, you know what, girl? She's like. I only have a few months to live and you are sitting here moping, moping over being miserable. And you know what the best thing about this? The best thing about this is you can change your life, right? You can change your life and you can do great things. She's like, I have less than one year and I can't do anything about that, right? And I was like, like I said, I was completely, completely shocked. And then, like I said, she uh, continued to drill me being like, okay, you know, what is your next step? How are we gonna fix this? You know, what is your plan? What choices are you gonna make today to become less miserable and to become more happy and the just that, you know, that you were when, you know, before your life happened? And so, yeah, and so uh, we continued to chat and I was like, honestly, like I was like, I'm going to be relating back to my Aunt Karen because if it wasn't for this conversation, I'd be still at, you know, like my probably some admin job, which, you know, I'm not saying is a bad job, but I'd be probably still in the wrong profession doing, doing, doing what I'm not like meant to be doing right so like i said super i was super super shocked when she had told me this and i was like holy crap uh no one has ever been that blunt and straight and real with me <sighs> talk about tough love because besides like 
Ugh, sorry, because aside from all of this, right? Like I said, my aunt Karen, like she knew everything about me. You know, we complained, like we, you know, we just shared everything. And like to get this news about like her her diagnosis and basically that her time was limited, it was it kind of really just hit home for me. And it was from that day I left with a whole new perspective. And I admit it took me some time to actually get the lesson that like time is of the essence. But over the course of that year, I eventually like got that lesson uh, that uh, that time waits for nobody and that that I started to like gain more and more respect for my time and other people's times, because at the end of the day, we never get our time back and tomorrow's never promised. So I took some time to process this. Um, you know, and as time went on, Christmas came and, you know, passed. Uh, and now, like I said, we were heading into the new year and like, you know, still, I'm still kind of in shock, right? And me and my auntie Karen had always just like, you know, texted back and forth, kept in touch. And, but I was still, like I said, I was still not ready to make the choices that I needed to do to make that next step, right? And so right after Christmas, uh, we like at the company that I was at, we had celebrated uh, our like the new year, right? My company threw a great new year's party. It was extravagant and elegant and, you know, everything that I'd been like accustomed to within the like, like last five years of working there. Um, however, right after the new year's party, the following Monday, six of my if, like coworkers got pulled into the office and I remember that day so clearly because we got pulled in from the office or to the office and we were informed that we were all going to get a layoff. And of course they pulled us in separately so we could have our own privacy because you know some people react differently to layoffs. And you know, for me, it had been my first, like it was about to be my first layoff. So I was like, oh God, in case I cry about it, uh, I'd rather be behind closed doors. So I really respected that privacy. However, like I said, um, uh, like I said, so I sat in that office and I'm sitting here with the owners of my company and I can literally see like, you know, they're like, oh, like, well, yeah, like we're going to be delivering some bad news and it's unfortunate that we're going to have to lay you off with no chance of rehire. And I was like, like in my head, I was like, okay, that's garbage. I've been here for five years. I know this is just like an expense thing and that you'll hire me back in the spring. And I'm like, you know what? It is what it is. And they're like, yeah, well, we're really sorry. And I'm like, first of all, you're not sorry because I can tell. And second of all, all I could do was giggle. Like, like I'm already socially awkward, but being told that, hey, uh, we're about to give you a layoff with no chance of ever re Higher. I honestly, in that point of time, all I could hear was my aunt Karen say to me, it was like, girl, you are set free. You have no other excuse to not be doing what you want to be doing, right? And so I giggled and like I left and like, I'm pretty sure the owners of the company, which, you know, I don't mean any disrespect. Uh, they probably thought I was just nuts. Like, who's happy about a layoff and who's ha happy, you know, about, um, you know, change and shifting and you know what I mean? Because honestly, let's get real. Change is scary. You know, not knowing how to pay your mortgage, your bills, like all, you know, all the life stuff is completely wild, like completely scary. But I remember leaving that day and I was like, holy man, like I could breathe again. Like I giggled, I giggled all the way back to the shop. I even texted my aunt Karen and I was like, hey, I got laid off. And all she could say was, yes, finally, you got your sign. And like I, like I said, if I could take a second and just to relive that moment and, you know, just tell everybody that, you know what, everything's only temporary, just to breathe, uh, life gets hard, but eventually all work out. I would have so, like, like I said, just relive that moment and whatnot. So, 
So anyway, uh, I went back to the shop with a huge smile on my face. Like I said, my coworkers were obviously like, super sad and they thought I, like I said, nuts, right? Because how can, you know, you've been a part of the team, the family for five years, and now like you have no chance of rehire. And I'm like, yeah, I, I just, I was happy. Like I was pumped. And like from that day forward, I decided that I was going to be happy. So what I'm about to share with you next is like, it's so funny and bear with me because the quality of the picture is terrible, but I had a flip phone back then. So this next picture is the day that I received my layoff. And for the first time since like, since the past decade, this is the first time that I remember or that I felt truly happy and that I had such a real, real laugh. And I'll never forget this day because this is the day that I vowed to myself that I was going to do anything and everything to make me happy. And that was it. There was no other option, no other excuse, none. And in order for me to be happy, I needed to start taking myself more serious, uh, started start to reflect and get like down and dirty right so uh so like i said in order for me to get to get there i started to keep myself accountable by following these steps so so anyway i started to do what was best for me i started to create smart goals i started to create a plan to like conquer my goals and and like, you know, just really, really get clear. I started to create boundaries with people that, you know, because as women, we need to help people, we need to fix people, we need to just, you know, we just, we just want to make other people happy. And I found that I was really suffocating. So in order for me to get myself back on track and happy and all this stuff, I needed to set these strict, strict boundaries. And I also needed to learn to let go. So for all, so for people who do not know uh, what SMART goals are, SMART goals are goals that are specific, measurable, attainable, reasonable, and timely. And I could not emphasize more that if your goals are, uh, if you do not write goals down, they do not exist. So I honestly live by this. Uh, it honestly keeps me accountable and it keeps me moving forward into the next direction. So after my layoff, I decided to do what was best for me. I packed up my dog, I packed up my dog, uh, I packed up my car and I went to BC. <laughs> and I traveled, I traveled and I, and I went to go see my childhood friend that I hadn't seen in years, right? We're obviously very close with our friends when we're in school and like when we have time and stuff, but when life happens, we kind of get distant. And I just, you know, we just lost that connection. And so I decided that, you know what, uh, what, what will make me happy is to go see my friend who, like I said, lived in BC, who was already working as a tradesperson, uh, who is an electrician, who has her own business. Like, I just need to go see her. I miss her. I need to have fun. I just need just to reflect and recap. So on that 12 hour uh, road trip north, I definitely took this time to reflect and I got really, really serious about what I truly wanted to do in my career. So when I got finally got to Fort Nelson, which thank God, because everyone who knows me knows I hate long trips. Uh, the best part about the trip was the no cell service, because honestly, if I never have, if I didn't have that 12 hours with no cell signal and no silence, uh, I would have never got the clarity and the signs that I needed to to start planning my next step, right? So once I got to Fort Nelson, my friend, uh, she was very gracious. She's like, hey, you know what? I kind of need some help in my office. Like, we can keep you busy until you figure out your next step and whatnot. And so I started to go to work with her every day. And I started to watch her leave the shop. Uh, you know, doing all electrical things and me sitting in this office and I was like, um, you know what, 
this office thing is still not for me. So whatever, like, so I took the work day and I, you know, like I said, from my previous job, I had learned to like work fast and get all my admin duties done in like four hours or less. And for the remaining of the day, I would progressively work on what I wanted to do and, you know, make a plan and take, you know, do the research and make the phone calls just, just to try to get to the next step. So on that trip, I decided that I was going to write my goals down because before this, like I said, I'm very adamant about writing stuff down, right? If you do not write stuff down, you it does not exist. And before that, I always had goals, but I had never written them down and I never got clear about what I was doing. I'd never write down the steps that I needed to take to get it done. And I never held myself accountable, right? So when I went up to BC, I had the extra time and I started to really think and get clear about what my next steps like were in my in my career. Like I was 25, really just had no idea, no sense and like and just trying to be happy, get my happiness back again. So I decided to make a list of the five things that I wanted to accomplish in the next five, like within, or sorry, by the time I was 30, so the next five years. So I got serious. So I wrote like, here's my list. Obviously it's not exactly because I wrote up on a piece of paper and um, I'm a big uh, fan of notebooks and journals and stuff. But anyway, so I, I started to write my career goals down. I wanted to become a heavy equipment operator. I wanted to become a truck driver. I wanted to fight fire. I wanted to own my business and I wanted to give back. And for each section, each talk, like each career choice that I chose, I knew that I would have to get specific about it, right? So for heavy equipment operating, um, you know, uh, for this one, I'd have to take a program. I'd have to touch touch and be more hands on. I'd have to find the right mentors and the right people to make that happen. Same with truck driving. I had to do specific things to get me there. Uh, I just didn't really know what order. I decided first to choose heavy equipment operating. And it was just so ironic because I'm a firm believer that everything happens for a reason and that there is universal signs everywhere. You just have to be present to see them and aware to see them. So it was quite funny because when I started my uh, trip to Fort Nelson and I was just dreading this ride, I had my radio station on. And I heard that my town that I was living in was offering a heavy equipment operator program. And I was like, what is this? I'm like, no. I'm like, could I really do this? Like. Like when, like, when did this happen, right? Because I had lived in uh, the town that I was living for for like the last four years and I had no idea that this was just so close to home. So I took, so as I drove to Fort Nelson like, and got really, really clear, I chose heavy equipment operating because it just, it was the most reasonable thing to do. So while I was, uh, while I was working in the office, I took time and I applied and I had called the college and I was like, you know what? I think I can do this. I am going to do this. So I applied and by the time by the time I had left Fort Nelson and within three months, I was sitting in a freaking dozer on a job site learning how to operate equipment and and like I said, that program, honestly, I highly recommend it to any women or to anyone who wants to get hands on equipment because, you know, working in the trades, it's hard to uh, find somebody who's willing to give you that chance. And I had tried and tried and tried and I had washed a lot of, you know, uh, equipment and, you know, and I had fixed a lot of equipment, but I never got the chance to operate. So I was like, holy crap, this actually happened. And that wouldn't have happened if I wouldn't have, like I said, been present enough to look for that universal sign, uh, you know, made a plan of attack and actually acted on it. So yeah, so moving forward, um, that same year, so three months after I completed my ATO program, I decided to become a truck driver. And it's just so funny because I think all my blessings happen uh, 
in in the cab of whatever I'm operating and when my radio station's on. Because I'm sitting here in the cab of a dozer and this advertisement for women building futures comes on. It's like, hey, women joining trades, you know, have you ever considered becoming a truck driver? And I was like, yeah, yeah, that's on my list. That's what I'm gonna do. And anyone who's worked in the trades knows that you need to get as much education as you can to be the last man standing. And it's it's just a smart thing to do. So when I was operating equipment, once my program completed, I immediately enrolled into uh uh, truck driving, which um, is actually quite crazy and nuts, but I knew it was the right thing to do because it was making me happy. So anyway, so I finally felt that I was back on track, right? Doing the stuff I always wanted to do and, you know, uh, doing like doing the stuff that I wanted to do, but yet I like deep down, I knew something was missing and, you know, and I was trying to not overthink it because you know, as women, we tend to overthink stuff. And I was like, okay, like I already had a cool like beginning of whatever year that was, you know, I had took my HEO certificate, I was getting experience, I, I was admitted into like this truck driving program, that's great. But I, for me, I just felt like something was missing. Like, I just knew that like, you know what, I'm going to keep doing this, but I need something else. So 25 i'm taking all these jobs i you know grateful for the educations but i'm still striving for something more and i don't know like i said if it's like a, a reality where it's like you know you're 25 you're more closer than 30 than you are 20 and for me i don't have kids but eventually as a you know, tradesperson, you know, supporting myself, I want to be able to support a family and I want to take that time to really enjoy it. And if I was going to do that, then I'd have to adapt my lifestyle to make that work. So I was having another discussion with my aunt Karen, which like I said, I always like to reference her because without her, I honestly don't think like her tough love, I honestly don't think that I would be here in this place at my in my life uh I, I i just wouldn't i just know right so i me and her obviously kept in touch over those few months where you know she was battling her disease and i was just exploring and changing and growing and she was just like very supportive and very present and very just like you know show me what actually mattered so I got her one day and i was like hey i'm like what do you feel or how do you feel about me starting my own business? And she's like, uh, well, yeah, you should have done it sooner because clearly she she had her own business uh, landscaping. And she's like, it was her only, like I said, she always told me if she could go back, if she could go back five years, if she could go back 10 years, this, this is what she would be doing. And the fact that she was in her forties, you know, on her last, you know, you know, on borrow, basically on borrowed time, that this is what the choices she would make now. So when I introduced to her that I wanted to run my own business and that maybe I wanted to uh, create my own clothing line, she was like, um, yes, please. She's like, uh, you should start doing that. You should start planning it. And I want a pair of this and I want a pair of this and already giving me her like what she wanted from my line that didn't exist. So I was like, okay, I felt very motivated. I felt very happy. And I'm like, you know what? While I pursue my career as a truck driver, heavy equipment operator, whatever I was being at that point, I was also going to explore, like I said, running my own business and getting this off the ground. So just to back up a little bit. So this was all, like, everything ha was happening so fast. Like that one year I got, my heavy equipment operate ticket. Three months later, I was in truck driving. And unfortunately, like, and during the truck driving uh, program, I had this epiphany that I wanted to have my own business. But unfortunately, during this time, and my aunt Karen had passed away from her disease. And that actually really, really hit me super hard. And I sulked, right? I like I said, I had experienced death and loss, but 
I had never experienced anything like this. I, yeah, I, for the next year after I completed all these things and did all these cool things, and I was working as a tradesperson in pipelining and oil fields, I literally stopped keeping myself accountable to my list of goals that I wanted to do. Um, I just stopped. I, I wasn't working towards them. I was working against them. I wanted to work for myself, but yet I took another 12 hour shift with a company that, you know, yes, was giving me more hands on experience, but it just, just didn't feel right. And I didn't care anymore. And it wasn't until my 26th birthday that this is like kind of embarrassing now, but uh, it wasn't until my 26th birthday that I was sulking in a dark basement, super depressed, super unhappy, and looking back at the year and being like, you know what, I had a good year, but why do I still feel this way? Why do I feel stuck, right? And I literally, like, like I said, universal signs and like feelings and auroras, like I literally felt my Aunt Karen's presence, my Aunt Karen's presence in the room that day. And I could feel her, like as I was like, you know, reevaluating everything I accomplished and you know what I was going to do and what I was wasn't going to do, I had just this just presence in this room that she was with me. So I decided to like let that be the last time that I was alone and depressed, like, you know, feeling depressed and sulky, and that I was going to reach out to anyone and everyone to make just happen again. So, like I said, at that time, I was pipelining and I was heavy equipment operating, and I was, you know, scouted by many com companies to do this and do that. And, you know, I was even picked up by the brother company. Uh, to the company that told me that I had never, like, ne I had no chance of rehire, no nothing, right? So I was, you know, I was feeling pretty accomplished, but still not feeling happy. Like, I just, something was missing. And, like, during that time, I had tried, like, multiple business gigs, and I do not know why I've ever gravitated away from my clothing line. Uh, I don't know. I just, like I said, you sometimes, like, when we do not write specifically what we want to accomplish in life down, we get distracted and deterred and we make excuses. And I was like, like I said, I was writing business plans for these stores and I was gonna just be a business owner and I wasn't gonna be present. And I was doing all these little things that gravitated me away from what actually made me happy. So I decided to, like I said, I. I just tried many things for that year and I tried to get myself back on course and and it wasn't until I was on a job site one day operating heavy equipment that I I actually got this epiphany and I was like holy crap. So I was operating scraper one day and I come out of my scraper and my superintendent just came up to me and he said, "You know what, Jess? He's like he's like the fact that you're wearing activewear to the job site is not okay. And it's not okay because of this and this and this. And I was like, dude, I was like, do you realize, like, let me backtrack. I'm all for safety, pro safety, pro this and OSHA and all this, but we were, I took a small gig road construction and I was working for like, uh, you know, my hometown, hometowns county and I knew that they were very flexible on what you could wear and what you couldn't, and that, you know, coveralls were optional. And as long as you had your reflective vest, so you were visible to the other operators, you were okay. But for some reason, me and my superintendent, we never really just jived, right? Like, uh, you know, we don't get along with everybody who we work with, and that's okay. So we just learn to work with each other, tolerate each other, and go home. So, I don't know today, like that day, he, like I said, was on my case and I, I felt he was like nitpicking. So when I came out of that scraper and he was just right there saying, nee, 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 you can't wear this and you can't wear this and you can't wear those tights because they're unsafe. And they, you know, he gave me this big, big spiel. And I actually looked at him that one, like that one time, and instead of like my brain wandering, I was like, 
hey, this guy actually, actually has a point. He has a point. I'm like, uh, first of all, the current actor we have to market isn't, isn't like safe for the job site. And I'm like, hmm, how can I fix that? And for all the women in this room right now, we are natural, natural problem solvers. So it just made sense, right? So I got back into my cab that day and I started thinking about it and thinking about it and thinking about it. And it's just, like I said, I had gotten this feeling. I'm like, if this was the chance to do my clothing line, this is now, this is what I'm going to do. Cause it makes sense. I can wear it, I, like I wear it every day. I have the experience to back it. Um, you know, it's comfortable, it, it breathes, it fits. So why not? And, and it doesn't exist. So I'm like, huh, I'm like, how can I start building a plan to make this happen? And it was so funny because it's like, like I said, I'm a sign believer. And every time that I got off track or I started to self doubt myself being like, okay, well, you know what? Some other company is going to do this. Um, there's probably something out there. Uh, my dozer operator would smack my equipment. Uh, so for those who don't know, scrapers take dirt away and often we need push cats to pulp push us to keep going because our weight of our load is so heavy. And every time that I started to self-doubt myself, my operator, who is my superintendent, would crank me. And it's like, it's like, it was like a freaking reality check, right? I'd be like, okay, you know what? How am I, how am I going to make this happen? You know, should I leave my 30 plus hour a job to literally, you know, invest everything that I've worked for? Go back to making minimal wage if that and all of a sudden that cat would hit me and i you know i'd be like shook for it and be like okay this is my auntie karen giving me my head shake because i can do this and i and i will do this and it was just it was just so funny because every time like i said i self-doubted myself uh like i said that equipment the contact would shake me out and be like okay nope nope and then i'd be up making my plan again so after that job ended, uh, I decided to quit the field. I decided to pack my bags and take a job uh, as a night shift uh, cashier for my cousin's convenience store. And I thought this was perfect, right? I was like, if, if the chance to do this clothing line was going to happen, it was going to be now. And so anyway, so I took this night shift job and I gave myself three months because I had made it clear to myself that, you know, I was only going to give myself three months to get this company done. Otherwise, anything beyond that was a distraction for me and that I needed to go back to the trades to keep my happiness up, to keep my, you know, strive and my goal list and, you know, my overall just love for life again. So I dedicated the, ne the next three months of my life to really just exploring and seeing what the options were to create my my potential clothing line and it wasn't like I quit the, my my road construction job at the end of October and it wasn't until January where I was like okay time has really really like you know went by so fast where am I at like did I find somebody who could help me did I you know find manufacturers like what was my solution here and my solution to my problem was like felt to me like it was a dead end. And I was sitting there at, on night shift, drinking a coffee with my laptop out. I'm sorry if my cousin's in here, I swear you, you paid for good time, right? So I had my laptop out and I was like, okay, it is January. I have to the end of this month to either create a different plan to make this happen or to go back. And at this point, my phone had been ringing off the hook with, you know, other pipeline gigs and oil field gigs. And they're like, hey, we're going to be starting up at the end of January. Uh, are you in or are you out? And I was like, Ooh, let me get back to you. And I would hang up, right? And I thought the first week of January, I was like, do I really, really want to go back to the oil field like now, right? I'm so stuck on get, making this happen. What do I need to do next? 
And it's just so funny because when I hit that dead end or what I felt like a dead end, I was, like I said, I believe in universal signs and I was on my laptop and I had opened Facebook. And on the right hand screen of my page, there was a program for entrepreneurs. And I'm like, excuse me. And I'm like, uh, first of all, I didn't really like classify, classify myself as an entrepreneur. I didn't even really know what an entrepreneur was. All I know is that my heart fluttered when I saw that ad. So I applied. And by the, the 15th of January, I got accepted into their program. And by February 5th, by February 5th, I was in their program, sitting in their classroom with like-minded entrepreneurs such as myself. And yeah, and from that on, uh, so from the, then on, I, like I said, I referred back to like, you know, the accountability with my SMART goals, with my, you know, what was I going to do next to, to make this clothing line happen? Uh, with this program, I got really, really clear on who Jess Black was, my mission, my vision, uh, where I was planning on taking this company. And, and I really validated that, hey, Clothing for women just needs, like, it needs to happen, right? So I really just validated my idea. I did my primary and secondary research. I, I just, I felt alive and I felt back on track and in exactly where I needed to be. So during this program, obviously, there, you know, uh, I hit many, like, roadblocks and, like, you know, good things that were happening. And... It was in this program that I stumbled upon a lunch, uh, lunch uh, without lunch. And I know Aaron's in this room right now, so I'm going to do a mention. Uh, I one day from this uh, active program, my friend encouraged me to go to one of these entrepreneur meetup groups, uh, lunch without lunch, which really should be served with lunch. Just saying, but. He encouraged me to come and support him because he was nervous about, you know, you know, starting a tech company and he needed the guidance and he needed resources and to meet people on how to get this done. Me, I was just like, well, as long as you pay for lunch for me, I will come with you and I will support you because this is what entrepreneurs do. do. And at this point in my business, I was like, okay, uh, I'm going to make these types of garments. However, like, I was still struggling with the fact that my fabric didn't exist. And so anyway, so we attended this lunch without lunch and I met with Aaron and I gave him a little like intro of what my company was and he, he instructed me and my friend to sit down. And there was a, it was a room full of like 20 people. We were separated in tables and he went around the room and I feel that he singled me out, which was great because I totally, totally needed this. He pointed at me and says, hey, uh, I want you to stand up. I want you to pitch your company. Tell me who you are, what you are, and where you're going, and the resources you need to get there. And I was like, yee. I was like, oh, okay. Like, um, like, are you sure? Like, ask my friend because I'm just here with him uh, in support. And he's like, no. He's like, stand up. You have a business. Let's hear about it. So I was like, oh, okay, um, my name is Jess. I am building, like I'm creating a all women's uh, clothing line. Uh, I'm having troubles finding my fabric to do this and I need help here. All of a sudden this room lit up and people were like, oh, hey, that's cool. Give handing me business cards and handing me like resource guides and you know guides and doing introductions. And I was just like, I was like, holy crap. I'm so glad that I stumbled on this like networking group, like this meeting that I wasn't even going to um, attend, right? So it was from there I decided to become a tech company. And what I really didn't understand, like, so, or, sorry, uh, decided to become a tech company. And it's from that point on that, like I said, I went back to my drawing board of how I wanted to be a business owner and how I got really specific. Like, you know, yes, I was going to make a uh, women's clothing line. I was going to be specifically 
activewear, and this is how I was going to do it. So I completed the ACTI program, went into the whole next phase mentorship, which was like all these follow-ups and all these craziness and all this good. And I came to a dead end because yes, I was a, a business owner, but I wasn't really tech, technically classified as a tech company yet. I didn't have a team. I didn't have anything in place. And honestly, I just didn't know how to get there. So I, like I said, I banged on all these doors. I did all my follow-ups and it wasn't until like I got to uh, Alberta Innovates, one of, uh, a program that helps entrepreneurs, specifically tech companies get off the ground, that I was able to get my tech company right off the ground. And I'm very, very grateful for this because like I said, I kept going back to my whole three month role. I was like, if you don't get this done, then you need to switch, you need to alter your plan. And every time that I was like at the end of like the three month rule where I was like, okay, I'm going to be a tech company. What am I gonna do about it? I'd always hit a roadblock and that roadblock always opened up into something else. And it wasn't until I knocked on Alberta Innovate's door and that their, one of their TDAs, uh, I don't know if he's in here, Mike, if you are super grateful, he was, he took the time to be like, holy crap, this girl is actually, sorry, this woman is actually putting in the time and the effort, and maybe she needs a little help. So I remember sitting with him for an hour and him shredding my business apart and helping me build it back up into a tech company. And I was like, holy man. And he said to me, he's like, if you get all these things done, you do all the required tasks, he's like, we will support your tech journey. And I was like, holy crap. I was like, uh, the, like I had never, like not once in my whole career that I ever thought that I would be a heavy equipment operator, you know, a truck driver, firefighter, you know, I never thought I would be a tech company. So anyway, so I, I pursued the, the, the task list that he told me or like he instructed and he helped me and he was very good about like, you know, me learning and adapting and, you know, you know, getting there and taking two steps back. He was just very, very um, patient. And by, or, sorry, and by the end of that three months, uh, I had surpassed and literally he like surpassed everything that he told me to do, met the right people. And within two months, I had a tech company. So this is just, I, okay. So today I run a advanced material research company and my team is located out of the University of Edmonton. And when I see this picture, I am so, so grateful and I'm so, so happy because this is hard work and resilience and dedication and pride. And it's, it's, it's my team. It's something that I literally thought, you know, five years ago, I would never have like happen. Uh, even three years ago when I've like decided firmly, when I was uh, decided firmly that I was going to create Just Black, that I would be here running a research team actually guiding because they like I said they do all the work and and yeah so when I see this picture I see dreams coming true and the just black journey and like you know results of like my goals and and I'm just so so grateful and now when I reflect today and like my journey in the trades and my uh, entrepreneurship and the time dedicated I am blown away, blown away. And as we move forward today, like uh, Jess, my company, Jess Black, still, it, like, it exists. And we have entered our fourth year of business. Oh, and, you know, we've created a fabric that is patent pending. And it's coming to the market here this fall. And this journey has been crazy because it's literally spun off like new research projects and developments. We're growing our team and we're preparing to go global. And 
like I said, if you would have told me that this would be my life now, that I literally, like I said, you know, raising money and, you know, pursuing dreams of, you know, everybody on my team, right? Because this is not at this point when I created Just Black, I wanted to create a clothing line that that was that provided the ultimate protection on the job site. And when I saw that the need and the demand was more, then I started it like, like I said, this whole plan of developing this company got bigger and bigger and bigger. And it required more and more people whose dreams were, like I said, like I said, in line with what I wanted to do. So, like I said, we've done so much in the past three years. We're so grateful. We've even raised, like I said, a lot of money and we are currently still raising. As Cecile said, we ran successful business uh, builder business campaign where it was, it was mind blowing how much support I got from fellow women entrepreneurs and people in industry. Uh, we received many research, or like a, not many, a few research grants that have been able to help me support my team and make my dream of, you know, having my clothing line happen. And like I said, and then um, one of the coolest accomplishments in this journey too is just black. And when I mean just black, I mean, you know, my team because you know, there's just no really just one just black. It's it's a team. It's 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 who we are. Uh, we got uh, named um, one of Alberta she, she Innovators. And for those who don't know, uh, She Innovators is a UNIT UN piloted project for women in tech companies, and it's where women come together to support women in tech and innovation. And it's a privilege that we've we're here. We've even gotten this recognition because, like I said, five years ago, I was in a miserable job. Three years ago, I was still unsure about my clothing line. And today, we are clear, we are moving forward, we are growing, and we are grateful. So now, I know I've run over time, and I really apologize because, you know, I should have warned everybody that once I get going, I start to ramble. Uh, if I can leave you with two powerful things that that really got me going through my hard times is that the first one is that you are unstoppable everyone in this room is unstoppable you have the power and the choice to change to change anything and to become anybody that you want in this world uh, you just have to decide that you want to right? Whether it's the trades, it's entrepreneurship, it's both, it's a completely uh, different profession. It doesn't matter. You are unstoppable and you can do this, okay? And the last thing I want to share with you is that if you are not happy in your current state, please be brave enough to change, okay? Because I never thought that I would be here pursuing, going, you know, research teams and like, you know, all these things. Like I, I never thought in a million years that I'd be working for somebody and then now working for myself. And yeah, and like I said, be brave, be strong enough to ask for help and just, just seriously, as in the words of my Aunt Karen, just jump. Thank you. Awesome, Jess. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. I'm sorry we went over time, everybody, but I think it was highly worth it. I apologize. Is there any questions? Does anybody have any questions before before um, Jess is gone? Getting a lot of thank yous in the chat, Jess. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know how to switch my screen off from the sharing, so. Oh, I can, uh, I can make you not the presenter anymore. Okay, thank you. Yay. And I just want to take the time again to thank everybody. Like, like I said, uh, just to let everyone know, this is my first actual one hour speaking event. And I, like I told Cecile 20 minutes before, I was super nervous, totally, totally knew I was just going to drop the ball in areas and get off track. So I appreciate you willing to stick around and be with me and support my journey in doing this 
my part in giving back and sharing. So thank you. Yeah, you're getting you did awesome. It was great. <laughs> yeah, and, and here's one lovely one. Um, loved hearing your story. Thank you for your candor. You are an inspiration. Oh, thank you. And courageous woman entrepreneur. So I'm just guessing that you inspired everybody, but nobody has any questions. You're pretty thorough. That's okay. Um, so I do this chat box. So my handle is, like I said, uh, is at justblack.ca. You can find me anywhere on social media there. And my email is this. Feel free to reach out to me to contact me. Uh, I'm still learning myself. And one of the greatest things about being an entrepreneur and trying new things is that I'm willing to help everybody with what I've learned and share my knowledge to help anyone get to the next level. You need a friend. You need that kick in the butt to make that choice. You you need the resources. Like I am so 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 grateful with all the people that helped me get on my journey and to where I'm going next, that it's, it's like I said, I'm willing to share it and I'm willing to like, you know, break it down even more for you. Really appreciate that. Just like, I can't thank you enough for sharing your story today and inspiring everyone and, and stepping outside your comfort zone. <laughs> uh, every day. Every, every day. day. Um, and just everybody that's still here, just to, to remind you, on Thursday, we have Daniel Matashuk joining us for a session. Um, he's going to talk about his journey with Mindable Inc. And um, next week, we have uh, Startup Edmonton joining us to help how to build out great ideas. So um, if you have any questions, you can email me. You all have my email address. And thanks again, Jess. It's been wonderful. Thanks for having me. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Wait, everyone.